Today on the Bander Says Podcast, we're going to be analyzing YouTube punishing you for external links, YouTube removing the related channels feature, Facebook's new one strike policy, and a whole lot more. So go ahead and stick around. Greetings, Earthlings, and welcome back to episode 160, Hate of the BSP. My name is Bandrew, this is what I says. Like always, down below there are timestamps of everything that I talk about so you can skip around and save a couple of minutes, but if you got the time, I would appreciate you checking out the entire episode. If you do want a different version of this show, either audio or video, you can find that at bandrewsays.com, or if you want other educational podcasts, you can find those at geeksrising.com. Let's start with the big hot topic item, YouTube punishing you for having external links in your video descriptions. This has been a hot topic for years now where people were speculating including external links will derank your video. Well, this last week, Creator Insider released a video on the topic of do external links in your video description negatively impact your video? And the answer is both yes and no. First, Let's address the no, because I think this will put a lot of people's conspiracies to rest. YouTube does not have any kind of system or algorithm that goes through and looks at every video description and says, we found an external link, let's go ahead and derank this video. It just doesn't happen. But I do wanna point out that your links to external sites do need to abide by YouTube's terms of service and if the site that you link to actually violates YouTube's terms of service, you can now get a channel strike for that. And I talked about this a couple of weeks ago where you would get a strike if any website that you link to egregiously violates YouTube's community guidelines. And an example that they give is linking to a pornographic website or a website with malware. And I will, of course, link their community guidelines in the show notes in case you want to read a little bit more about what you can and can't link to. But now let's address the yes, where external links do actually harm your video's performance. And I'll start by saying this. My understanding of how YouTube works is it ranks videos based on how engaging they are and how much your viewers like them. And this is judged by something called watch sessions, meaning if you're the first video someone watches and then they end up watching 10 hours of videos, that is great because you started that 10 hour watch session and YouTube will say, this video is great. It will lead to people watching more content on our platform. But on the other hand, if you are the first video someone watches and then they immediately click off the website and don't watch any other videos on YouTube, that is terrible. YouTube will say, this is clearly a bad video. It led to somebody saying, I don't want to watch anything else and they will derank it. They will say, this is a bad video. Now, because YouTube doesn't know what the viewer is actually thinking, they have no way to tell why that person left the platform, and they will interpret that as your video providing the audience with a bad experience. So, the existence of external links doesn't harm your video's ranking or distribution directly, but your video being the final video in a watch session can harm your video's performance, and someone clicking on an external link in your description and going to a different website would count as the end of a watch session. So it does indirectly mean your video can be harmed in terms of distribution and performance. So with this information, what can you do? The first thing I think you need to do is implement end screens because what that does is at the end of the video for the last 20 seconds, it will show up with playlists that you put there or other videos that people can watch and that will lead them to watching more content on YouTube and will make your video look better in YouTube's eyes. The second is you really need to start to implement cards. And the way I think you should be implementing them is go into your YouTube analytics, look at where your audience retention is, and see at what point people start to drop off the video. Maybe 10 or 15 seconds before people typically start to drop off your video, start to put cards at that timestamp so people will have something to click on when they start to lose interest in the video they're watching. That will also help your watch session and lead people who are watching your videos to watching more videos on YouTube. And the third thing I think we need to address is something that a lot of people probably don't want to hear, 
but I don't think you should be including a thousand calls to action in the end of every single video. I have heard some people say that you should only link to external websites if you are getting income from that, whether it be affiliate links, whether it be to a sale for one of your products, or whether it be to some kind of service that you're providing. They say they only link to stuff externally if they get money for that because it can actually harm the distribution of your video. I personally don't subscribe to this idea though. I get it, but I think it's a little bit short-sighted because yes, it may actually harm the distribution and performance of your video, but I think it's equally as important to grow your following on other platforms like Twitter or your own website, bandrewscott.com, by the way. That's my personal website. So to summarize my stance on all of this or the news in general, external links can actually negatively impact your video's performance if they lead to the end of someone's watch session, meaning your video is the last one that somebody watches before they leave YouTube. And I don't think you necessarily need to stop linking to stuff externally, but maybe limit how much stuff you link to. Don't say, go check out my personal website, go subscribe on Twitter and Facebook, and then go check out this other website, this is really cool. Maybe say, hey, if you want more, follow me on Twitter. And then have all the videos surrounding you on the end card. Try to keep people on the platform and make your call to action memorable so when they are done watching stuff on YouTube, then they will go follow you on Twitter or go to bandrewscott.com and check what's going on there. That's it for that first piece of news. Now we got YouTube removing related channels. This comes from another recent video from the Creator Insider channel, and they announced that related channels are going to be phased out. If you're unaware of what related channels are, it used to be a box on the right-hand side of a channel that showed channels that YouTube viewed as similar to yours. I went to actually take a screenshot of this so I could include it in the video version of the show, but it's actually already gone. They phased that out really quickly. <laughs> That's really the entire news story there. There's nothing you can do about it. They're gone. You can't fix it. <laughs> but I don't think you honestly need to be concerned with this. And the reason that I say that is you can still have featured channels on your homepage on YouTube. If you don't know what featured channels are, that's another section on the right-hand side of your page. But these channels are channels that you manually select. You can put any channel that you want there. And secondly, apparently this feature wasn't being clicked much, so it should have almost zero impact on traffic. So there's no reason to be concerned there. Now, I actually think that this is good news, and I'll explain because a lot of people may be thinking, well, it seems neutral. If you weren't getting any traffic, who cares? So let me share a personal experience that I had with the related channels feature, which led me to think that it was just an all around really bad feature. There used to be another audio channel on YouTube who would talk about audio gear, but who also absolutely hated my guts. Now, because I review audio gear and this guy reviewed audio gear, he showed up in my related channels. And because he hated me so much and didn't care about his YouTube channel, he decided to change his channel name to include racial slurs. What that means is when somebody would go to my page, they would scroll down, see related channels, and see racial slurs posted right there on the front page of my channel. Because some people don't understand that it's not a direct endorsement, it's YouTube automatically generating these correlations between channels, that could be seen as me endorsing the use of that language. That's not a good thing. I was not happy about that. So I ended up having to disable that feature for maybe six months or even a year because I didn't want to be associated with somebody who used that type of language and used it in their freaking channel name. It was insane that they did that. But of course, that was a very extreme example in my case. So here is a more realistic one. Maybe you run a political commentary channel and YouTube might lump someone with a diametrically opposed opinion to you in with your channel. So you would have Ben Shapiro linking to the Young Turks as related channels. And some viewer who doesn't understand that's automatically generated would say, well, the Young Turks are clearly endorsing Ben Shapiro or vice versa. And that's the problem that I saw with the related channels feature. I am personally happy that it's gone. 
It doesn't seem like it was driving traffic, so you shouldn't be concerned about that. And now nobody is going to be confused about you endorsing some channel that talks about stuff that you find rather disgusting. So ultimately, I think it's a good thing. I saw a tweet from another YouTuber on this topic. This is from This Is Tech Today. Brandon, great channel if you're looking for general tech news and discussions, great stuff. In his tweet, he said, A concern I have from the loss of auto-generated related channels is the loss of information on what YouTube understands about my channel, the people that watch my content, and what other channels they watch. Is it possible to repurpose that data and with further clarity and context be put into Studio Beta to use as a tool for creators? It helps us better understand things like channel clusters and has been massively helpful for me in being strategic about my content. Thanks. I think that Brandon raised a rather interesting point there where you want to understand what YouTube thinks of your channel and who it lumps you together with. What are they going to put your videos next to in the algorithm? But I still don't think it's necessarily a very important analytic to look at. The reason I say that is YouTube seems to be devaluing subscriptions and even visiting channels as a whole. The majority of views seem to be coming from YouTube's homepage which is algorithmically generated. It's not people going to your homepage or your channel. It's them getting served your videos on the homepage. So it's a little bit less important in that regard. Additionally, YouTube has been rolling out some really amazing new analytics in the studio beta with performance cards or report cards or whatever the hell they're calling them. And if you're watching the video version of this show, right here is the experimental channel report card. It tells me at the top, it's a slow start to the week. Your channel is getting 12% fewer views than usual. And then if we scroll down a little bit in this dashboard, it tells me exactly what is causing that. Viewers are watching your videos 36% less often from recommendations on YouTube, and viewers are watching your videos 9% less often from search results. So even though YouTube is removing features like related channels, which may help us personally gauge what channels YouTube thinks we're similar to, I just think that information is far less important nowadays and YouTube is providing us the information that is more valuable and what they focus on when developing channels and featuring channels. Look at the analytics. They essentially tell you and show you exactly what you should be focusing on if you want your channel to do well because these are the analytics that YouTube is using to determine if they're going to promote your video further. That's it for the YouTube news. Now let's jump to Facebook. Facebook is implementing a new one-strike rule for live streamers. In a newsroom blog post that they just released, they stated, we will now apply a one-strike policy to live in connection with a broader range of offenses. From now on, anyone who violates our most serious policies will be restricted from using live for set periods of time. For example, 30 days, starting on their first offense. They go on, we plan on extending these restrictions to other areas over the coming weeks, beginning with preventing those same people from creating ads on Facebook. And I want to start by saying, I get it, I get it completely. Facebook didn't come out looking good after the Christchurch incident, so I understand why they are making changes and getting more strict with who's able to use their live streaming feature. But... If they've already banned conspiracy theorists, not just removed their ability to live stream, but completely banned them off the platform and labeled them dangerous individuals and organizations, and that is the bar for being labeled by Facebook a dangerous individual and organization, what would be crossing the line to get a live stream strike or a strike to remove your ability to live stream? But like I already said, I do understand exactly why they are doing this because the live platform on Facebook has been abused in a pretty awful way, but I simply don't agree with how Facebook has implemented their policies in the past. Now, there's nothing you can do about this if you're a creator. I don't think you can change the policy. There's no workaround. You just have to follow the rules. But if I was a creator, I would just not rely on Facebook for live streaming, especially if that's something that's an essential revenue stream. If you focus on live streaming on Facebook and that's where you get all your money, maybe you need to start reconsidering where you're live streaming or how you're live streaming. If I were in that situation, I would start looking into solutions or options on how to live stream from my own website. 
Now, don't interpret this as me saying you need to abandon all social media because that would be ridiculous. And social media is essential if you want to grow a brand, a brand for yourself online. It's absolutely essential. I just want to take this news story as an opportunity to advocate that you look at things a little bit differently and don't rely solely on these third party companies for all of your income. It seems a little bit dangerous. So I came up with a couple of alternatives for you. You could set up a live page on your website. And this was inspired by the gentlemen and gentlewomen over at the Gunna Geek Network, gunnageek.com, awesome podcast network. So for instance, set up a URL. In my instance, geeksrising.live. This directs to a website or a page on the Geeks Rising podcast network where we can embed a live stream video. But why is this better, Bandrew? You don't make any sense since you're still live streaming. Let me explain. Just cool your tits. So (laughs) now people know to go to geeksrising.live whenever they want to watch a Geeks Rising live stream. If I were to ever get banned off YouTube, I could go find another streaming service and embed that live stream on the website. Then I don't have to worry about telling people, hey, you need to go find me on this new video streaming service, find the channel, subscribe to it, follow me there, and then I'll link you this really confusing URL. You don't need to worry about that. Your audience can just go to geeksrising.live and they will see the live stream. There will be no interruptions and no confusion on their end. They get the content that they want and you get the audience that you have developed. They know where to go to see you live and you don't have to worry about being banned because there are other options out there. You are just driving people to your website as opposed to some third party's website. But here's another option if that's a little bit too difficult or maybe you don't want to pay for a website and hosting and all of that. Just buy the domain. Buy a domain that's specifically for live streaming. They're 12 bucks a year. Geeksrising.live. Then when you have the domain, you can redirect that wherever you want. So instead of saying, hey, I'm streaming on YouTube over here, Here's a link, youtube.com slash you are just whatever the hell the URL is. Instead of posting that, I'm live streaming geeksrising.live and then it will redirect them to your live stream page on whatever platform that you're on. So it's not hosted on your page. It's not where all the chat is, where the video is embedded, but you are still giving them a URL that will remain consistent regardless of whether or not you're banned on a platform. You can always direct them there and then redirect that website URL, to whatever service you want. And that is it. I will, of course, link the Facebook Newsroom blog post in the show notes. Next, we got one piece of Apple news, and this is not creator news, but it's somewhat interesting, and I'll keep it short. The Supreme Court is going to allow Apple's antitrust case to move forward. This does not mean that Apple has lost the antitrust case and they're a monopoly and they're going to be broken up or anything. It simply means that now consumers can bring an antitrust lawsuit against Apple. And I just want to share a couple of parts of this TechCrunch article with you because I think it's insane. The iPhone owners also said that Apple's monopoly on the aftermarket for apps means they're forced to pay higher prices than if the environment was more competitive. In a different environment, they could have chosen between paying Apple's higher price and other less costly alternatives. Instead, iPhone owners say that developers are forced to mark up their prices in order to cover Apple's demanded profit. So I understand that there is some potential unfairness in the Apple App Store because Apple doesn't have to pay that 30% tax. So there will be some unfair advantage for Apple. I understand that. But the thing that I think is absurd about this entire thing is the pricing argument. The consumer seems to have devalued what developers do, and they expect everything for an insanely low price that, in my opinion, doesn't seem sustainable, which is why we've been seeing a move to more subscription services so they can actually support the app and actually survive and eat. Call me crazy, but I just personally don't think that $13 a month for Spotify is excessive or too costly. You have access to all the music in the world. You have access to all the music in the world. You wouldn't even be able to buy a CD for $13 15 years ago. But now you're paying less than the cost of a CD and you're getting access to everything. 13 bucks is excessive. (laughs) 
<laughs> oh my god. Poor baby. $13 to access everything. All the music ever created. <laughs> what are you talking about? What are you talking about? You're a bunch of crazy dopes. No, you're getting an amazing deal. Go buy all the CDs that you want to listen to. It'll cost a hell of a lot more money than $13 a month. Oh, this 99 cent app is exorbitantly expensive because of Apple's demanded profit. If they removed that demand for profit, I could get it for 70 cents instead of 99. Are you crazy? 99 cents is excessively expensive? You're insane people. The pricing argument is absolutely moronic. You are not going to win any case by saying 99 cents is excessive or $13 for access to all the music ever created is excessive. That is insanity. We've entered insane land. You're not going to win a case on that grounds, maybe on the antitrust in regards to Apple not having to pay that same price so they can offer a lower cost and that will lead Apple consumers to purchase from Apple instead of Spotify. Maybe in that regards, but the pricing argument, shut up, shut your mouth. No, you're wrong. <laughs> now that I've offended everybody, <laughs> let's jump to what you had to say. The first comment comes from Nate Downey, and he says, I think I have a good solution for YouTube's ad crisis. I am sure the advertisers have some kind of their own YouTube account. They should be able to block the channels they don't want their ads running on. Everyone wins. Advertisers can say to the mob they don't advertise on dangerous channels. Advertisers that don't care will have their ads running on those channels and will make them money. Channels will still be monetized. YouTube gets more ad revenue. Seems to be a better solution than a blanket ban on a channel. Nate, I think that is a very good suggestion, and I think something similar to that actually works. I believe in the back end of the ad platform, there are a few different options to keep your ads on content that you want to advertise on. I believe you can blacklist certain channels. And secondly, you can say, I want to advertise on this type of content based on a couple of YouTube's categories that they have in the back, whether it be a controversial topic, bad language, sexual content, anything along those lines. They can say, we want to advertise on this category and this category, do not advertise on this category. So with that information, I think there are a few different scenarios that could be leading to this advertiser outrage. First, advertisers do know how to use this platform. They're blacklisting channels. They're saying, do not advertise on this type of content. And YouTube is ignoring it. They are ignoring the blacklist and just placing their ads wherever the heck they want. That's the first option. The second, the companies aren't even trying to blacklist content and they just are pushing the blame onto YouTube so they don't have any responsibility for advertising responsibly. I know that sounded a bit redundant, but here's the problem I see with the blacklisting method. I think, I think we'll end there. I think there are just too many channels and too many videos are uploaded every single day. It would be multiple people doing a full-time job to go out, find all the content that doesn't match up with your brand and blacklist them. That would be an impossible task. So there has to be some kind of automation to limit the amount of work that goes into that. And that's what they tried to do with the categorization of channels and videos into what type of content it is. Does it have a tragic event? Is it sexual in nature? Does it have any kind of bad language? That type of categories. That's the method that they went because that is much more manageable than saying, okay, go out and blacklist the channels that you don't want to advertise on. That would be an impossibility. Next comment comes from, I don't want a channel, I'm just commenting. Just monetize viewers, not content. Advertisers are currently saying that if I believe in the content that the conspiracy news network produces, then my money isn't good enough for them. You can't boycott Alex Jones' sponsors if the sponsors are targeted at me instead of his content. Problem solved. I don't want a channel, I'm just commenting. I believe that's kind of what they're doing right now with Google and Facebook, where they are advertising based on demographics rather than the video that the ad is being placed on. They are saying, I want to advertise for males and females in the United States from the age of 18 to 27. And it will go ahead and push the ad to that demographic, regardless of the video that is being placed on. 
We're seeing a shift here, though, where people are wanting these ad agencies to not use that method anymore and focus on actually actively supporting individual channels where they say, don't blanket all of YouTube. Just select a few channels and advertise there because you know their content is safe. So I think we'll see a big decrease in the success of these ads because demographic marketing doesn't seem to be limiting enough. It allows for your ads to show up on dangerous videos. For instance, seeing an ad for Coca-Cola on a video for World War II doesn't mean that Coca-Cola supports Hitler. It doesn't mean that. It means that you, the viewer, fit into a demographic that Coca-Cola is trying to reach. But I think what's really going on right now is people essentially lying to drum up outrage. I don't think anybody believes that Coca-Cola's ad showing up on Paul Joseph Watson's YouTube videos means that Coca-Cola supports Paul Joseph Watson's ideas. That's not the case. I think what's really going on is people just don't like Paul Joseph Watson or Alex Jones, and they don't want them to have access to any money. You can't have advertisers, you can't have access to bank accounts, and they are trying to put pressure where it can really hurt them, which is their wallet. So no matter the approach to placing ads, I think it's inevitable that people will find a way to attack your income streams if they actually dislike you and want to hurt you. Good comment, good suggestion. Next comment comes from Gut Punch News, and he says, I think YouTube is killing itself by creating a problem that doesn't actually exist. They keep saying companies won't pay for advertisements when a topic is too controversial, yet these same companies advertise on TV. The last time I checked, people can hate something about anything, including the milk toast viewpoint that you have on political issues. Hey, hey. <laughs> Your unbiased opinion is obviously biased. Gut punch news. Ow, that hurt. Milk toast. How dare you? <laughs> I think that's exactly the problem, though. Any stance can be offensive to anyone. And the double standard that these advertising agencies have is absurd. And I said this maybe six months ago. I don't think these companies really care about their ads being on controversial content. They couldn't care less. They care about, are you going to buy a Coca-Cola after you watch this conspiracy video? That's what they really care about. It seems to me, if I have my conspiracy hat on, is that these companies are just acting outraged and saying, we're not going to advertise on this, to gain some chips at the bargaining table, to have an upper hand, saying, well, you know what, we'll bring our dollars back if you give us a slightly better rate. That's my theory there. Now, as far as my milk toast approach, gut punch news, milk toast. I'm just kidding. I've called myself milk toast. It's self-proclaimed milk toast content. <laughs> it can be tremendously biased and offensive to want to listen to opinions from multiple people who disagree with one another. How offensive hearing people's opinions. <laughs> Wink. Anyways, next comment comes from Rogelio. He says, this is not the real Bandrew. If you take a look at 3958, you'll see him drinking water instead of coffee. Must be fake. Oh my God. Oh my God, Lord, can both throw onto us. Red alert, red alert, red alert. No, definitely not. I swear. Not a member of the reptilian elite. Not at all. Nothing to see here. I don't even know what that is. Reptilian elite. Why did I say that? I don't know that. Um... Get me out of here. Throw on to me, Lord Kimbo. Get me out of here. Shit. And this next comment is going to be somewhat difficult for me to cover because they're exposing me for something. They're accusing me of something very serious, and I just want to address it before it gets out there and before I get articles written about me like, oh my God, I can't believe what this YouTuber did. Comes from, I don't want a channel. I'm just commenting again. He says, at 2412, you said Jesus. The far right talks about Jesus. Are you sure you aren't far right? I would like to take this moment to publicly apologize for saying a word that the far right has used in the past. This was a huge oversight on my behalf, and I would like to ask Jesus for his forgiveness. I just, I said it again, didn't I? Uh-oh. All right, confirmed, I guess. <laughs> Let's jump to my favorite part of the show, the Ask Bander segment. Uh, 
All right. If y'all got any questions, comments, concerns, feedback, you can send that in. Ask Bandrew at gmail.com. And don't think it just has to be text. This is an audio place. We all love audio. Send in an audio clip. Record on your awesome sounding microphone. Send in a video. I'll include that. And the added bonus there, other than hearing your beautiful voice on this show, you don't have to listen to me read, which is painful. (laughs) You don't hear the unedited versions of me reading. It is atrocious. Send that in. Ask Bandrew at gmail.com. First comment, first comment, first email comes from Stefan. Hello, Bandrew. What's the interesting and strong looking mic stand you are using? Like your reviews? Might want to look at FYY. I don't know what that link is. I'm not going to include it. Stefan, thank you very much for the email. I was previously using the Blue Compass boom arm. The reason I switched away from it The Neumann KMS-105, which is the mic I'm using, is a bit light, and the microphone arm would just slowly move away from me throughout the thing, throughout the recording process, so I would have to constantly put my hand up and hold the microphone stand down. Got to be too much of a pain, so I switched to this boom arm that I am using right now. I don't know the model number, but it is a LixPro L-Y-X-P-R-O. It holds the microphone wherever you set it because it has these screws at every single joint that are really well set there. It doesn't move around at all. One huge downside to this, it has external springs. So if I were to bump one of those springs, you would hear that. That's why I really prefer microphone boom arms that have internal springs or anything like that because I don't like having the possibility of bumping a string and having to deal with that. I don't like that jingle jangle sound going on there. Good question. Next email comes from Sonny. Hey, Bandrew. I was looking at purchasing the XM8500 to plug into my Behringer 802 mixer, and I noticed listed in the specs, the sensitivity of the microphone is negative 70 dB. Seeing as how that seems insanely low, I was wondering if you could tell me how accurate that is. I watched back your video reviewing the microphone, and it didn't seem to need near that much gain. Thanks, Sonny. Sonny, that is a great question, and I think I actually addressed this pretty recently. That's an incorrect spec, or maybe I shouldn't say incorrect. That's not a standard way of measuring the sensitivity. They're using an older method, which makes it seem like it's significantly lower. What it really is, it's more around negative 50. So it's right in line with a lot of dynamics, if not slightly hotter than the majority of dynamics like the SM7B or 58. I think it's slightly louder than the 58, the 57, the likes of that. So I think you would be perfectly fine with the XM8500 and the 802 USB because yeah, it's not negative 70 dB. That's a completely misleading and incorrect spec. Next is a video submission. Eldest bro coming through like the legend that he truly is. Again, reminder, if you don't want to listen to me read, send in your audio and video clips to askbandrew at gmail.com. Let's jump to what he has to say. Greetings, Bandrew. Eldest bro here from the Fourth Wall Alliance. I wanted to get your opinion on something that um, was just recently released by Google. So Google, in their latest I.O. conference, released a statement on what they're going to be rolling out in their new Android Q. Um, It is a software or a feature that is going to allow people to have live transcribed versions of audio that plays on their phones, like the captioning that you can get on your YouTube videos. And the way that it's going to work is it just takes whatever audio is playing on your phone, i.e. a video, a live stream, a podcast, video calls, and will live transcribe it into text that you can read on your phone. And that's cool and all for the hearing impaired people, but this is giving Google direct access to whatever audio is playing on your phone. I know that It's Google, it's running on Android, but they already had that. But this is giving them explicit permission to run this. And what got me thinking about this is that they're saying that uh, the company has begun to, or is trying to do this with phone calls. Actual phone calls. It doesn't have to be through Google Hangouts or Google Duo or anything. Your actual phone calls that are going out. You're going to be able to get live 
transcribed versions of this call. And they're saying once it's transcribed, it's instantly deleted. It's not saved anywhere and it doesn't have to be connected to the internet. But this is Google and we do know that they do like collecting data. So I want to hear your opinion on this. Thank you. See you later. Eldest bro, what are you doing, man? I don't need any more layers on my tinfoil hat. You bully. You're bullying the crazy person. Do you not feel bad? <laughs> this does concern me, of course, to a certain extent. I'll say that. I went ahead and found a TechCrunch article talking about this. I will link that in the show notes. There are apparently two implementations here. There is Google Transcribe and Google Caption. Transcribe is a standalone app that requires that you open the app up so it can start listening to sounds around you and start transcribing any spoken word. Caption, on the other hand, does the exact same thing, but for videos, voice messages, and video calls. I am perfectly okay with the Transcribe app because when you open that up, you are giving it permission to start transcribing what's going on around you. You know that is what is happening. You are opening it up. It is going to begin listening to the conversation you're having. Caption, on the other hand, does have some useful tools. I'll start by saying that. I think transcribed voicemails are insanely useful. I almost never listen to voicemails anymore. I just look at the text because I don't have to actually read it out loud. I can read fine just reading it, but reading out loud, that's where I suffer. What concerns me is the transcription of what you're watching or private phone conversations. This raises the question of where is the processing being done? Is the phone capable of doing all of this transcription locally? Or is it being streamed back to Google servers, transcribed, sent back to your phone, and then once you hang up, or once you stop watching that video, then it deletes it? Where is the processing taking place? Because if it's being sent back to Google servers, we don't know. But as you say, it apparently gets deleted right after a call ends, but you would have to take Google's word for it, which I am not one to like to do that. I am not keen to take Google's word for anything. I imagine that there would be some kind of setting that is easily accessible to shut this off and say, do not listen to anything ever. Do not transcribe anything ever. Do not listen or track what I am watching. Do not listen to my video calls. Do not listen to my podcasts. Don't do any of that. Don't pay attention to me. Let me live on my own. Let me be a curmudgeon where you don't know anything about me, Google. Not Maybe not that extreme, but I imagine this would be a feature that is easily turned off because it is going to raise a lot of red flags in a lot of people's minds. Now, while I say I am concerned with this, as you know, I am very paranoid. There are a lot of people that have always on microphones around them with smart speakers or even cell phones. So I'm fully aware that I am hypocritical being that I have a smartphone on me at all times and always on microphone or a potential always on microphone right near me all the time. So I do think that Google rolling out accessibility features is a good thing, but at the same time, the tin foil is going on a little bit thicker as the days go on. And as I mentioned, I will link the TechCrunch article in the show notes if you want to read more about that announcement. That is it for the news and the what you had to say, the Ask Bandrew, one personal announcement right here at the end. I am absolutely beyond thrilled that we have brought on another show to the Geeks Rising podcast network, the Tourette's podcast. Just in time for Tourette's Awareness Month, which is May 15th, the June 15th, the host, Ben, amazing guy, great taste in punk music, really nice guy, loved chatting with him over the last couple of years or year or so, really great guy. But on this show, Ben chats with people who have been diagnosed with TS, which is Tourette syndrome, as well as their family members. And I think it's incredible. The reason that I like it so much and why I wanted him to be a part of the network is because he's working so hard and doing such a good job at destigmatizing Tourette's, which has been so widely misunderstood and been the butt of so many jokes, which I imagine as somebody with Tourette's would not be fun. You being the butt of a bunch of jokes, very cheap jokes at that. So if you're someone 
who has Tourette's, if you know someone who has Tourette's, or if you're just interested in learning about Tourette's and hearing some really fun and fascinating and interesting and educational conversations about Tourette's, check out the podcast. Highly recommend it. And his audio quality, oh my God, always right on point. Ben, if you're listening, keep up the amazing audio production. I love it. If you want to check it out, just go to geeksrising.com. And at the top of the page, there is a huge banner for Tourette's Awareness Month, which will link to his show. Go check that out. That is going to wrap up for today. Thank you all so much for watching. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being you, your awesome self. You all are amazing. I appreciate you. I'll talk to you next week. Thanks for watching. Bye. This has been a Geeks Rising production, your executive producer of Andrew Scott. For more information, head over to www.geeksrising.com.